about that. Then we're going to get in to talking about images and how to use images on your web. We haven't done so far, and, and, and uh, they really add a lot to web pages. So let's go and download the example from last time and build upon it. a second just to review what we have from last time. So, we have our page. This is a page, I believe, that has the CSS in it. And it does. We spent a little bit of time trying to make it look nice by using the color picker. All right. Um, yeah, by no means you have to use a color picker, but it's just a good way for you, um, especially if you're not really sure about what colors go together. Um, it's kind of a skill to be able to do that, to be able to, to, to like look at color combinations and say they're good. And, and you know, some people have it, some people don't. Uh, and for the people that don't have it, though, um, you, get, you, get, you can use one of those uh, color pickers to help you out. So let's look at the code for this. Notice we have our HTML. We then have in our head section a style section. Now it's set out from the HTML by using a style tag. That tells the browser, hey, this is not HTML code. This looks different than HTML code. We don't have the tags like we have. All right? So the browser knows how to interpret this then if you set it off like this. Your CSS code is comprised of a set of rules. The rules follow this pattern. First, there is a selector. Then there are braces around attribute, colon, value, semicolon. And that is repeated as often as you need. All right, so you can set a whole bunch of attributes, not just one or two or whatever. You can set up a whole bunch of attributes. Now, for the most part, this is all that there is in CSS, selectors, attributes. There's a couple other things, all right, but hey, that's not bad, right? Well, as the old saying goes, the devil's in the details. What's tough about this is there's so many different ways that you can select what gets applied. For example, we've selected every H1 on this page. Well, sometimes you don't want every H1. Maybe you only want one H1 to look a special way and the other H1s to look a different way. Well, there's ways that you can do that via the selector so you don't select every H1. You just select a specified H1. All right? Um, the other thing is that there's a whole mess of attributes and values that you can use. Um, I encourage you to play around with that, even if we haven't covered it in class. Uh, we're going to be, just as a class proceeds, I'll talk about this one or that one. I'll slip them in or where it makes sense or whatever. But you can already get sort of a jump start on that if you go to the W3Schools site. And look under Learn CSS. There's a tutorial. This is a great site. And what is particularly good about it 
is this try it yourself feature. I sound like a salesman here, all right? Here's how this try it yourself feature works. You click on it, you get the code over here, and you get what the page looks like over here. So I can say, for example, what happens if I change the background color to red? I click Run, and it shows me right there. So it's a nice tool to play around with. Now notice, I've been using background in class, and they've been using background-color. We'll talk more about that, because sometimes it's almost like you can sometimes use a person's first name and, and last name, or you can sometimes just use a person's first name, and, and they'll know what you're doing. So there's different ways to supply uh, the names of the attributes. Um, so background color and background both work. All right. Let's make it maze because it's fall. Let's make it green because it's not spring. There we go. All right. Now, if we go back to this, we'll see all different kinds of, of things. So, for example, if you want to change the fonts, talks a little bit about fonts, and there are examples. That shows you how to set the font of a particular uh, things um, on the page. Notice a dot serif refers to any paragraph that has a class of serif. So that's a different kind of selector. So already we're able to narrow it down to say not everything on the page, but just these paragraphs that have a class of serif. Um, here's on text formatting. We can change the color. We can change the alignment of the text. So if you want to center something, text align equals center, text align left, text align right, and so on. So I would encourage you before, uh, even before we talk about it in class, if you want to experiment with this. If you run into problems in lab, I'll be glad to give you a hand with it. But it's not like uh, you only have to use the stuff that we talked about in class. You know, you're welcome to experiment and, and have a ball and, and, and play around with it and, and see what you come up with. All right? But that's what we're going to be studying throughout the course. We're going to be studying different ways to select things on the page and different attributes that you can set. Because we can control everything on the page, virtually everything on the page, to make the page look totally different by only changing the CSS. Now there's a great website out, out there called CSS Zen Garden. And what it is, is it's a demonstration of just how much you can do with CSS. This site was first uh, created back in the old days when people really didn't know about CSS and were like reluctant to use it because it was like the new unknown thing and people got in the habits developing their web pages using only HTML, and people were suspicious about this new thing, and, and rightfully so, because uh, the browsers didn't support CSS completely, so CSS sometimes didn't work. But now that's not the case. CSS works very well uh, across different browsers, um, and you can do so much more with CSS than you can do with just HTML. And so let's go to CSS Zen Garden. And let's see what's so great about it. CSS Zen Garden is a, pay, is, a, is a site that really is only one page, all right, for the most part. Um, however, that page has been styled by world-class web designers to look a bunch of different ways by only changing the CSS. So every page that we look at on this site has the exact same HTML. The only thing that has changed is the CSS. So this is the basic home page. And 
let's, let's notice a few things about this page. There's the word CSS Zen Garden, the beauty of CSS design, view all designs, text, a demonstration of what can be accomplished, the road to enlightenment, so what is this all about, and so on. Down here, on the bottom of the page, or partway through, not quite at the bottom, is other versions of the same page, where the HTML is identical and the CSS is different. So let's look at Floral Touch. Exact same web page. CSS Zen Garden, the beauty of CSS design. A demonstration of what can be accomplished visually through CSS-based design. Mid-century modern, the beauty of CSS design, a demonstration of what can be accomplished. CSS Zen Garden, you can even make the text go vertical if you want instead of horizontal. The road to enlightenment. Apothecary, sounds like something from Harry Potter. Dr. Shea's Miraculous CSS Zen Garden, the beauty of CSS design, a demonstration of what can be accomplished, and so on. A robot named Jimmy. This is one of my favorite ones, if I remember right. There you go. Look at that little animation it's done through CSS. The Road to Enlightenment, and so on. So, the point is, is that you can make your page look way different simply by changing the CSS and leaving the HTML the same. You can do that if you follow the rules. And the rules are, first and foremost, you use only CSS to change the appearance of the page. So any of the things in HTML that change the appearance of the page, you avoid using. So font tags, break tags, center tags, all those tags that only contribute the appearance of the page to the appearance of the page, avoid using those and instead use the CSS because there's CSS to do all those things. All right? Um, that's one thing uh, uh, to do. Um, there's a lot of advantages to this. Like I said, you can change your organization site and not just one page on the site, but the entire site simply by changing the CSS file. So like I mentioned, if you want your site to have a seasonal look, all right? If your company rebrands, in other words, they come out with a new logo and a new design and all that kind of stuff, you can easily change uh, all the pages on your site, all right? If you just decide on a better layout for your site, you can easily change all, all of those. Okay, um, in addition, there's a couple other advantages. When you're developing your site, if you're developing your site and presenting it to a potential client or to a client, you can say, well, I came up with a couple designs for your web page. Take a look at these. Here's design A, here's design B, here's design C. And they could look at it and say, yeah, I like B. Or I like a little bit about A and a little bit about C. Can you sort of blend them together? Well, yeah. You know, you could go and just mix and match the CSS file and have sort of what they want. So it's good that you can make different versions of the, of the page even when you're developing it because you can show it to your users, the people that you're developing the site for, and let them decide what to do, all right, what they like best. The other big advantage of applying different style sheets is when you're viewing a site on a mobile device versus on a desktop device. All right? We'll talk more about this later on in the semester, but essentially mobile device, mobile websites, or websites that you view through your mobile device using a web browser. Generally speaking, they work better on a mobile device if they're simpler. All right. By simpler, I mean a single column instead of multiple columns. You know, a lot of web pages have multiple columns. That doesn't really work well on a mobile device simply because of the limitations of the screen. Works better to have a single column on uh, a web page. Well, does that mean you have two different web pages? Not necessarily. In some cases, you can take the exact same web page and simply apply different CSS to it. And then, 
Here's a site that looks good on a desktop browser. Here's a site that looks good on a mobile browser. Same HTML, different CSS is applied. All right, and we'll talk about the ways that you can do that. Now, the one last thing I want to talk about CSS before we get on to images is making it so that your CSS is on all of your pages. I guess the simplest way to do that, but it's not the right way, would be to copy and paste this code into my other web page. Why is that not a good idea? What well, if you have 50 pages, right? Is it hard to copy and paste? No. Is it hard to copy and paste 50 times and make sure you get it perfect every single time? Yeah, I guess a little harder, all right? So that's one thing. The trouble also comes in if you decide to change something. If I decide to say, hey, this color is a little too light, I'm going to make a darker version of this color. Guess what? You have to change that in 50 different places. All right? And again, is that hard to do? No. Are you liable to forget about a page or make a mistake when you paste or whatever? Absolutely. Much better would it be if you could put all that CSS code in one place and let every page on your site refer to it. So that's what we're going to do next. All right? Now, uh, you might say, what if one page has a slightly different style than the other pages? Well, there's ways that we can handle that. For right now, we're going to be thinking of, the, of a simpler situation where all the pages on your site have sort of pretty much exactly the same layout, which isn't that uncommon, right? It's a good idea for the pages on your site to have a consistent look, right? Okay, so the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to create a CSS file. So I'm going to go up to File and say New. All right, so I'm going to create a new file. I'm going to take the CSS code. Now, if I'm putting the CSS in a separate file, I don't need the style tag. So I'm going to copy just this code. I'm going to leave out the style tag. Leave out the style tag. All right. And I'm going to save this. And I'm going to save it as a CSS file, which if you have Notepad++, you go and pick CSS. If you have Notepad, just click All Files again down here. And you call it what you want your CSS file to be called. I usually call it something like main.css because it's the main CSS for the site. And I put it in the same folder with the rest of my stuff. So there it is. It's in the same folder with the rest of the stuff. Remember, right now in class, we're assuming everything is in the same folder. All right? So all your web pages, uh, your CSS files, in a few minutes here when we talk about images, we're going to assume they're all in the same folder. And then you'll just zip up that folder and send it to me. Later on, we'll figure out what we're going to do if we have, like, say, a whole bunch of files and we want to organize them, like maybe put the images in one folder and uh, web pages in another folder and so on. But for right now, we're going to just go with the simplest assumption that everything's in the same folder. So if everything's in the same folder then, you're going to replace the style code with a link tag. Now, this is a, sort of different than uh, like a, a, an HTML hyperlink. This is simply saying, hey, I want to use this CSS file. Type equals text slash CSS. rel equals style sheet. Then href equals the name of the file. Again, and we're assuming it's all in the same folder. All right.
I remember all this exactly because I've done this a million times, right? It'll take you a while before you remember it. So get it done right once and then just copy and paste it. All right, so I'm going to save this now. And now I'm going to view my page again. And notice that it doesn't work. All right. Ah, what did I do wrong? It's main, not style. Duh. So let's go and save it and view it again. There we go. All right. So now it works. So to put it on other pages, for example, we have a second page on our site about CISS 216 that doesn't have that style. We simply copy the link tag. Now that link tag, is, again, is in the head section. But we copy it from that file to that file. And now, both pages have the same style. And again, if it works for two, it could work for 200. Right? You have all your pages pointing to the same CSS file so that if you change the CSS file, both pages get to change. So for example, if I were to change, if I wanted to change um, the page so that Put a border around some things, all right? This is where this class gets dangerous, because I start fiddling with these CSS rules, and it's like, well, what if I do this? What if I do that? Let's put a border around the navigation. Again, selector, what gets the rule? List of rules. Border. One pixel, black, solid. That means it's one pixel wide, the border. Let's make it bigger so that we can really see it. Let's make it 10 pixels. All right? The border is going to be black, and it's going to be a solid line. There's a whole bunch of other options. You can make it dotted. You can make it dashed. You can make sort of like a almost look like a groove, sort of like a fake 3D effect. But we're just going to keep it simple and go with solid. So now we go and look, and boom, both pages get that change. This page doesn't have a nav. It figures. All right? Notice it didn't blow up, though, if it doesn't have a nav. Let's change something else. Let's change an H2. Let's, let's change this to say the, that the H2, the borders, get, uh, the borders go around the H2 instead of the borders uh, around the nav, because both pages have H2s. And there you go. Both pages are treated consistently. Now notice how, again, I'm not going to say this is a example of a well-designed web page. I mean, this is far from it. But notice how already we're moving in a direction where it looks a lot more polished and finished. Instead of just a plain old white background, it has a somewhat aesthetically pleasing uh, thing. And more important than that, we're sort of visually separating our page into sections. The user, at a glance, can see that this is a section, this is a section, this is a section. If it's just white with, a, with black text on it, everything sort of blends together. This allows you to 
allows the user to visually separate this page into different pieces, all right, in different sections. So we don't use these techniques just to make it look pretty. We certainly want it to look nice, but just as important as looking nice is making it easier for people to navigate the page and making it easier for people to understand at a, gla at a glance what the page is, look is like and how the page is structured. Um, I heard, <laughs> there's all kinds of goofy things going on with the camera back there. It, it, it was showing the ceiling somewhere. There we go. Uh, sorry for the distraction. Uh, I've heard people say that, well, if those of you that wear glasses, I guess depending on how bad your eyesight is, you know, if you take off your glasses and look at the page, at a glance, you should sort of get the structure of the page. And when I take off my glasses, even though I can't see very well at all, I can still see that the H1 is one thing, the H2s are different things, and I can see how the page is divided in sections. It's very clear. If uh, you don't have, uh, uh, if, you, if you don't wear glasses and you have great eyesight, you kind of have to blur your eyes a little bit, all right? Or, or stand way back, you know, go in, go in the next room or go in the Iloff building and look at it. Pardon me? Or borrow someone's glasses. Or borrow, there you go, borrow someone's glasses. All right. Um, so the idea is, is at a glance, that's sort of what that represents, at a glance, when people see this, they sort of instantly see that this page is divided into sections because the style helps tell them that. This gets back to the rule or the guideline that I talked about before where I said use CSS purposefully. CSS isn't only used to make the page look nice, it helps people get a sense of how the page's content is organized. All right, questions on any of this? Yes? Uh -huh. You can use CSS to find the flash and find the pictures as well. Yes. Yes. Good observation. Uh, the question was, is, uh, uh, on the CSS Zen Garden, if you noticed, there were different pictures on different pages. Uh, and the question was, is can you put images into CSS? And yes, you can put background images into CSS. You can display images two different ways uh, on a web page, one through HTML, one through CSS. Um, for the most part, if the image is like an, an important part of the content of the page, you would put it in the HTML. So for example, if you had a news report about the Indians winning their millionth game in a row or something like that, and you had a picture of you know, someone hitting a home run, that's an integral part of the content. So that would be in the HTML. If, however, you just had a page that had a nice little thing in the background, uh, just sort of like, uh, like wallpaper almost, then that kind of image you'd put in the HTML. Or, I'm sorry, in the CSS. Yes? Now, if you want to put the animation in like the robot header, uh -huh. how would you go about doing that? Uh, that is, uh, again, th that's a topic for a class itself. But let's look. Let's, let's, why not look? Simple CSS animation example. CSS animation for beginners. Here's some of the things that you can you can put. You can describe how you're going to transform things. By transform means that you're going to change something. So you're going to scale this to be in a tenth of the size. Then you're going to scale it to be 1.2 times the size, and you're going to scale it to be 100%. This is going to give a bounce effect. It's going to start out small, it's going to get bigger, and then it's going to shrink down. You can specify how long the animation is going to take, and so on, and there you go. No, no one uses Flash anymore. The only places that use Flash are places that used to use Flash. <laughs> yeah. Um, now, now, Flash as a tool, I believe, has been in, has been converted to do um, CSS animation. But the, the actual application, Flash itself, really, the only thing you're going to see that in is like legacy stuff. And you know who killed Flash? 
We, we can pin it on one person, believe it or not. Who killed Flash? It's a murder mystery of software. I'll tell you who killed Flash. Steve Jobs killed Flash. All right? How did Steve Jobs kill Flash? Well, Steve Jobs killed Flash when he said that the iPhone and iPad would not support Flash. All right? So when that happened, his days were numbered. All right? All right. So, yeah, if you want to look and play around with this, by all means, go ahead. It's, like, not that hard. It's not easy. But, you know, with a little bit of, of work, you can uh, figure it out. You can do all kinds of really, really, really cool things uh, with this. Um, basic animations. Here's an example. I will say this is one of those things you got to be careful about. You're going to have a blast making the square twirl around. All right? You're going to spend hours on that. You're going to spend more time on that than you will on the rest of your website. All right? Because it's fun. However, does it add value to the user? Yes. It would just, to, to insert an animated uh, GIF on the page, it would just be the same code that we'd use for an image. You just would use, uh, you'd use the, the GIF file. Now this is a little more purposeful. When you hover over this, because that sort of tells the user, hey, this is something you can probably click on. Even though in this example it doesn't do anything if you click on it. All right. Okay, enough about this. Let's go and talk about images. And I'm going to build a brand new website um, for this. And I'm going to build it generally the way that I build a regular website, if I was doing this for real. I'm first going to do the, the, uh, develop the HTML code to get it to, to have the content that I want on the page. Then I'm going to play around with the style. All right? So let me download some images here. I use these images because I took these pictures, and I like these pictures. And more importantly, I don't have to worry about copyright for these pictures because I took them. They're in here called ZooPix. I'm going to go and download it. Maybe. Extract it. renaming folders so that I remember how everything is. All right, so I'm going to make a folder called Zoo. I'm going to put my code for my Zoo website in here. So I'm going to, I'm going to put these pictures in my Zoo folder. Again, our assumption for now is that everything's in the same folder. All right. I have three pictures, image one, two, and three. So I'm going to create a page. Image one and two are of lions. All right. So I'm going to go in to my Notepad++. And 
and I'm going to create my web page. Maybe. Let's say something like lions are sometimes called king of the beasts and so on. Remember I could go and I could insert Greek text here if I wanted more of a placeholder to, to show what the page would look like when I have the final um, copy for my page. Keep in mind, you might be the web developer. Let's, let's say we were doing this web page for the Cleveland Zoo. You might be the web developer who's responsible for that, but maybe the, the lion expert in the zoo is going to write the little article about it, right? So, you, you know, they, they promise to get it to you by Friday. Well, that doesn't mean, unfortunately, that you just get to sit at your desk playing Tetris until they send it to you, all right? You have to keep working on it anyhow. So you might put Greek text in there to say, well, okay, I don't know exactly what the lion person is going to say, but I'm going to put this in as a placeholder. So let me go and actually do that. I'll Google Greek text. I get this page. I can click and say I want one paragraph of Greek text, and then I can copy it. And I can put it in a paragraph. All right. So now I want to put my images. All right. An image tag is IMG. All right. So IMG means it's an image. Now, we have to give additional information, right? Because what image is it? I don't know. You might have hundreds of images on your website. Which one do I want? So I have to give the name of the file that the image is in. All right. And I have to give the name of the file exactly. By that, I mean I have to give the file name and the extension. If we look out here, the name of this file is 1.jpg. It's a JPEG, which is one of the types of files that can appear on your page. Uh, the three uh, image files that, that work on browsers um, are image, GIF, and PNG, or JPEG, GIF, and PNG. Um, depending on how your, your system is configured, you might only see the one. And I forget, oh. Oh, on Windows 10, if that is checked off, then you only see one, two, and three. All right? Where you need the exact file name. And even knowing it's a JPEG isn't enough, because some JPEGs are named .jpg, some are called .jpeg, and some are called .jpe. So make sure on your system that the file na name extensions are visible, so that you can see the exact name of the web page. That's 
ties to uh, HTML pages as well. You have to get the exact name of it. All right, so I want this image to be on my page. So I will say source src equals 1.jpg. There's one other attribute I have, and that's called an alternate text. The alternate text is used for two things. For one, th for one thing, if there happens to be an error where that image can't load, like someone accidentally deleted it off of your web server, all right, it will put text up there to say what that image was, all right, to sort of like tell people what they're missing, all right. It's also used uh, for people that are blind that navigate your page through uh, a screen reader. So the screen reader actually reads the page to you, and of course, it can't like say what the image looks like, so it reads the alternate text. So I could say a picture of a lion lying down, whatever. Now, image tags don't really have anything between the start and end tag. It's what's called an empty tag. What you can do with an empty tag is you can do this, boom. What that tells you is that this is a start and end tag rolled into one. So I could do this. But that's kind of kind of goofy. All right? It's easier just to do this. And that's what I typically do. You actually can by the way omit the end tag for an image. All right? But I, I like the habit of always having an end tag for every tag so that they go in pairs. All right, let's see what this gives us. So I'm going to go and save it. I'm going to save it in the same folder that my images are in. It's an HTML file. And we'll call it lion.html. Now I can go and view that in the browser. And there we go. <laughs> Google thinks that we're talking Latin, so it asks us if we want to translate the page. There we go. Now, we have our second image. So we can put it right next to this. There's the other picture. Okay, there we go. Not, not bad, not hard. Now, let's say we think those images are too big. They're kind of big, right? We don't necessarily need them this big. So let's say we're going to make them smaller, all right? There's a couple ways that you can make the image smaller, all right? You can make the image smaller using CSS. And later on, we're going to talk about how to do that, all right? The other thing you can do is you can physically go and edit the image using a photo editor or an image editor. How many of you have ever used an image editor of any kind? All right, maybe half of you. You don't have to become an expert in Photoshop or, or anything like that. One image editor I would suggest that you look at getting is called GIMP, G-I-M-P. And the reason that I say that is it's a free and open source application. And it is very powerful. It's a professional level tool. It's not some rinky-dink, cheap, free software uh, application that doesn't do much. People, professionals use it. Professional graphic designers use it. And it's free. So does it do as much as Photoshop? Well, it does quite a bit. Maybe not quite as much as Photoshop. But when you consider the cost of GIMP versus the cost of Photoshop, well, it starts to look real good. All right. Um, 
at the very, 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 very least, any machine is likely to have some editor on it. What's the classic editor of images on Windows machines? Paint, all right? Paint's not good, but paint can do a couple things pretty easy, pretty simple. So we'll look at this, all right? What if we want to make this picture smaller, all right? First thing to remember, always have an original of the image before you start editing it, editing it. Just in case you do something that you want to later go and undo. Here's a reason for this. I can make an image smaller and it'll be okay. All right? So this is maybe 800 pixels wide, 600 pixels tall, maybe. I could make it half as big. I could make it 400 by 300, for example. And it won't, and it won't change the quality of the picture. It'll make it smaller, but the picture will still be as sharp. I could even make it real small. And the picture, again, it'll be smaller, but it'll still be sharp. So I can make a picture smaller, and that's OK. I can never, however, make a picture bigger. Because if I make a picture bigger, there's not enough information. I've lost, as soon as I made it smaller, I've lost information. So if I try to make it bigger again, the program that I'm using has to guess at that information. And it'll do a good job guessing, as good as you can expect, but the result will not be very sharp. On Monday, I'll probably show you an example of exactly what I mean. All right, but until then, just take my word for it. Can't make an image bigger. So let's say I go and I resize this image, and I make it about this big. And I put it up on the web page, and I think, you know, it, that's not really good. I want it to be a little bit bigger. Well, if I edited the original, then I'm out of luck, right? Because I can't make it bigger. If, however, I have a copy of it before I started editing it, then I can start fresh. All right? So I made a copy of all these images in a folder called Zoopix. So that's my backup. If I make it too small and I decide, hey, you know, I need to make it bigger, I can go back to the backup. Just to finish this up, I'm going to go into Zoo. And I'm going to edit the first lion picture. So I'm going to right mouse on it. I'm going to say open edit or open with paint. I can go here to let's try this again. I can go here to resize under image, and I can change it either by horizontal uh, in vertical percentages or pixels. So I can say I want it 50% as big. Or I can say I want it to be instead of 800 by 619, I can make it 400 by something. It's important to maintain aspect ratio. If you don't do that, that makes sure that the height and the width resize at the same ratio. Because if I resize the one to be half as big and the other to be a third as big, I'm going to stretch out the image. I'm either going to make the, the lion too stretched out vertically or too stretched out horizontally. So I will go and I'll make the, the, the image be 300 pixels. Notice how it calculates the vertical automatically. I'll click OK. Yeah, that looks like a good size. I'll go and save it, and then I can view it again, and there the image is, is more reasonably sized. All right, this is what we'll pick up on on Monday. We'll finish this example out. In this example, we're going to explore images. We're also going to uh, explore more CSS, and that's going to kind of be the way that it goes, right? Uh, for every new thing that we talk about, we'll talk about some HTML stuff, and then we'll talk about some CSS stuff. All right, we'll see you up in lab.